the dreams. They haven't seen what you can do. There is power. Your name. Well, shalom, everyone, and welcome to our Shabbat Shalom service. It is September 1st, 2023, and we are excited about all that Jehovah is doing in the lives of his children, especially those that are part of this service, this opportunity to study together. So, we know that whenever we are obedient, blessings will flow. So we thank you for the Ruach HaKodesh. We yield these earthen vessels. Fill us all the more with your presence. We have this music plan, and we don't own the rights to the music, but we use it to get our hearts and minds ready to receive. All oh, the Ruach HaKodesh will speak to us through this word on tonight. There's power in the word. So we thank you for joining us. Shalom. We're going to listen to this music. Get our hearts and minds ready. Shut out the cares of this world. And prepare to receive. Yeshua said, wherever two or three gather together in my name, I will be there in the midst. And we are grateful. We are grateful that the Ruach HaKodesh has been given. That we, are, we confess that Yeshua is Mashiach to the glory of Jehovah our Elohim. And with that, he sent the Ruach HaKodesh to come and guide us into all truth, opening our hearts and minds to receive all that he would say to us. We are excited. We are listening to this music and we are just fired up to bring forth this word on tonight. Shalom all that are here. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, as you join, shut your mic off so we don't hear that background noise. Thank you. Listen to the music. Let's get our hearts ready to receive on tonight. Yeah, she'll do the impossible. It'll be unimaginable. So much wants to shower his love upon us, and he does it through his word. He will speak to our heart. He will speak to our hearts and just elevate our minds. And even on tonight, our lesson, lesson 47. In Hebrew, Re'e, it means to yes. have spiritual insight. Moshe says, see, see with the spirit. Let your spirit be nourished by what Moshe is telling us on tonight. How with obedience, all things come and line up for us. It is. I don't care what nobody says, what the words say. And I believe he said it is so. He said, I believe it is so. Believe. said just because you said it I receive it I received it when you said it now we just do the process 
manifestation. For you cannot lie. Just because you said it, it is so. As Jehovah promised you something, no matter what it looked like, <laughs> he said it, that settled it. As you did, I heard you. I heard you in spirit and in the natural. I know you said. Move it. You'll move the unmovable. Break the unbreak. Okay. Yes, we believe. Yes. yes, we need a miracle. Yes. But that's what he does. No matter what it looks like. Yes, you said it. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Oh, it doesn't matter what it looks like. I'm standing on your word. Yes, I'm standing on your word. God, we believe. Oh. Yes, we believe. <laughs> Glory. Hallelujah. Let me get this off so we get it our word because we got a lot to go through on tonight. But didn't he say it? <laughs> settles it. He said it. That settles it. And she said, no matter what it looked like. <laughs> No matter what it looks like, I'm standing on your word. That's all I'm going to stand. And I mean, some challenges come our way, but guess what? You don't have to apologize for testing us and preparing us for what he said. All right, with that, let us pray and get in our lesson tonight. And... Get your communion elements together because on Shabbat, we take communion. So let us pray. Jehovah, our Elohim, creator of all things, king of the universe, we thank you for this opportunity on social media to study your word together, to praise you and glorify you with the songs of our heart and our minds, give you all the praise and all the glory. Now, we thank you for the Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, that comes to guide us through this lesson on tonight. Wherever two or three of us are gathered together in your name, you said you would be there, and I believe it. So we open our hearts and minds to receive that you would say to us on tonight. And in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray this prayer as we prepare for communion, thank you for wherever we are obedient to what you told us. And you told us, do it often, always in remembrance of you. So Yeshua, HaMashiach, we are obedient to your word. Now let your blessings flow in accordance with what you said. Amen and amen. All right. Let's uh, get our communion elements together. A long lesson, and we want to try to get through it in this time that we've been given. And we try to do it in one hour. And that song, 
I couldn't turn that off, so I had to play it twice for me. So, <laughs> so we, we excited. Thank you all so much, Shalom, for joining. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. And whether it's live right now or tomorrow and the next day as we post it, um, take this word and meditate. Chew on it. And let's see what the Ruach HaKodesh will speak to your heart. And now, we know that Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah, said on the night before his death, he took bread and he broke it and shared it through all his disciples. First, he prayed the prayer over the food. Barukata Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaAlom HaMotzi Lehim HaAretz. We bless you. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Then he took this loaf and passed it around, told everyone to break a piece. He said, this bread is a symbol of my body, my body that is broken just for you. Do this often, always in remembrance of me. And so they ate. Next, he took the cup. We say it was the cup of redemption. He took, prayed to the Father, Barukata Yehovah Eloheinu Melech Ha'alom, Borai Pari Hagafain. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth and who creates the fruit of the vine. Then he passed the cup around. He said, each one of you take and drink. For this is symbolic of my blood, my blood that is shed for the remission of your sin and for a new, renewed relationship with me. Do it often, always in remembrance of me. And so each one drank. All right. Yes, we got a long lesson tonight. But we are blessed because whenever we do what he say, we know blessings going to come. So I know everybody got some petitions before the Lord. So when you're obedient, he's going to bless. So get ready. Let's get this screen ready. Shared screen for our lesson on tonight. All right, let's get our slideshow ready. There we go. All right, so it is September 1st, 2023. And this is lesson 47 of 52 lessons through the Torah in one year. We're getting there. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and the end of this month is the beginning of Sukkot. So... This is an exciting time because guess what? After the seven days of Sukkot, I can't wait to be on the land where we can build us or put our little tents out there and live <laughs> for these seven days. That's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Seven days of studying the word every day, eating and fellowshipping and just, I mean, buffet every day. So the people would bring their animals to the temple, the animals would be sacrificed to Jehovah, and the meat, in many cases, was given to the families to eat, have festival, because Jehovah wants us to have a great time because we are in his presence and we should enjoy all that he does. And so we can't wait for that opportunity to really get out and do that 
And then we have the Passover and unleavened bread at the beginning of the spring. Then in the uh, heart of the summer, we have Sukkot, a couple of days when we come together around the understanding that on, on Sukkot, not only did Jehovah show up on Mount Sinai, scare us half to death, but speak those words and all the people heard him. But also Yeshua said, go back and wait on the power from on high. And then on Sukkot, people call it Pentecost, but on Sukkot, I mean, I'm sorry, Shavuot. On Shavuot, the Holy Spirit came to guide us on our journey and empower us to do what we were created to do. So with that, let us get into our lesson, lesson 47, titled Re, which means see. But in this context, Moshe is going to kind of recount a lot that he's taught the children of Israel, before his departure, he's going to recount it. But he's telling them to open your eyes, your spiritual eyes, and see what I'm saying. And then shma, listen with the intent on being obedient. And as you purpose to be obedient, I already told you what I do, but you have to be obedient. Why? Because in obedience, he knows what's best. And in obedience, he blesses. Why? Because that's what he intended with what he was telling us to do. Everything he tells us is good for us because he made us. So with that, let's get into our introduction on tonight. In this week's reading, Ray, Moshe continues addressing the Israelites just before he passes away. Just before the Israelites are going to cross the Jordan River and enter the land of what will be Israel, but at the present it is Canaan. Moshe, or Moses, commands the Israelites to proclaim certain blessings and curses on Mount Grazim and Mount Ebal after they enter the land of Israel. He directs them to destroy all vestiges of idolatry from the promised land. They've had time to clean up, clean up their act. They have refused to do it. And so with that, they're going to forfeit their presence on this land that Jehovah is going to use to establish his covenant with his children. He goes on. They must then designate a city where the divine presence will dwell in the holy temple and they are forbidden from offering sacrifices anywhere else. And so Moshe is speaking prophetically because at the time it was just the tabernacle that could be assembled and taken down, disassembled and moved on. Well, when they get into the land, it's going to have a place where it is. But then under King David, David's going to say, I want to build you a house, Jehovah. You've been so good. Jehovah says, you can't do it, but your son, Slomo or Solomon, he will do it. So we see that Re means see. So he's exhorting the Jewish people. He says, I, pre I present before you today a blessing and a curse. The emphasis on the word seeing isn't the difference between a blessing and a curse obvious. What we see, however, is not a result of what we are looking at, but a function of who we are. He's trying to enlighten us as to who we are. And the Torah is not grievous. It's not hard. But we got a war against that Yetzirah, that evil inclination. But he says, take heart, for I have overcome. And behold, I give you power over all the power, the suggestive power, the physical power of the enemy. He goes on and says, 
How many times in our lives have situations that you brought to be blessings, you thought to be blessings, turned out to be a curse or the enemy meant it for a curse, but you took it with your spiritual eyes and made it the blessing that Jehovah had sent forth for you. Seeing the difference between a blessing and a curse requires knowing what they are. And how do we know? By learning what a blessing or curse is in the eyes of Jehovah, our Elohim. We learn what the blessing is. He said, behold, I will. Then there has to be, if you will, this is what I'll do. We went through that in depth last week. So now we're going to open our spiritual eyes and see what the Ruach HaKodesh speaks to us tonight as Moses or Moshe goes back and encapsulates all that he's taught them, specifically through the book of Leviticus, for his imminent departure. We want to see reality not through our subjective and distorted eyes, but through our godly lens, our spiritual eyes, as revealed to us by the Torah. With that, we begin. Deuteronomy chapter 25, I mean chapter 11, verse 25 or 26. See, that's the word, Ray. I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the commands of Jehovah, your Elohim, that I am giving you today. And the curse, if you don't listen to the commands of Jehovah, your Elohim. But turn aside from the way I am ordering you today, says Moshe, and follow other gods that you have not known. Remember, what we've been studying what Shaul is saying in Romans. We, it may seem that this is not functional for us today, but no matter what it is we want to do in the sense of what Jehovah has instructed us to do, we have filled our hearts and our minds full of junk. And now the sanctification, the peeling away of the madness and lining us up with the word is taking place. Moshe says, when you hope your Elohim brings you into the land you are entering in order to take possession of it, you ought to put the blessing on Mount Rizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Both are west of the Jordan in the direction of the sunset in the land of Canaan, living in the Arva across from Gilgal, near pistachio trees of Moray. Look at the prophetic word he's telling them about where they're going to be. And these mountains are there. He says, for you are to cross the Jordan to enter and take possession of the land Jehovah your Elohim is giving you. You are to own it and live in it. And you are to take care to follow all the laws and rulings I am setting before you today. We go on. Chapter 12. Now we're going to get into some of these, breaking down some of these things that we're supposed to do. Here are the laws and rulings you are to observe and obey in the land Jehovah, the Elohim of your ancestors, has given you to possess as long as you live on the earth. You must destroy all the places where the nations you are dispossessing serve their gods, whether on high mountains, on hills, or under some leafy tree. Break down their altars, smash their standing stones to pieces, burn up their sacred poles completely, and cut down the carved images of their gods. Exterminate their name from that place. So we look at that and we say, well, that don't mean us. Yeah, we have to understand that once we come into the knowledge of who Jehovah is and his son Yeshua HaMashiach, then we have to do what? We have to smash all those things in our minds that have hindered us from understanding this word prior. We have to get rid of that junk. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to 
peel it back. And, and, and the word says it cuts to the right to the marrow of the bone. So we have to do that. So this doesn't mean that we don't have to do anything because the land has been taken care of. No, we have to do this in our own mind. That's why Re'e means see with your spiritual eye. He said, but you are not to treat your over your Elohim this way, like they do their God. Whether you are to come to the place where Jehovah your Elohim will put his name. All right, now we're getting into his prophetic utterance concerning the temple. He will choose it from all your tribes and you will seek out that place. We know that David fulfilled this prophecy, which is where he will live and go there. You will bring there your burnt offering, your sacrifices, your tents that you set aside for Jehovah. The offerings that you give, the offerings you have vowed, your voluntary offerings, and the firstborn of your cattle and sheep. Now he's recounting the book of Leviticus or the scroll of Leviticus. We go on. Okay, now we got that. I'm up a little bit too high, so I got to get to that page so that I can see what's going on right there. All right, there. He says, there you will eat in the presence of Jehovah, your Elohim, and you will rejoice over everything you set out to do. You and your households in which Jehovah your Elohim has blessed you. So see, when you're bringing the tithes, part of that, you're going to eat yourself. You're going to eat part of what you bring yourself with your family because you're going to be having a festival in front of Jehovah. You will not do things the way uh, we do them here. Now he's talking about the fact that things are different. They're going to be different in the land. Why? Because right now we're in one location all around the tabernacle. But then when we book this place, when we build this place, you're going to leave no matter wherever you are and come to that place. He says, where everyone does whatever in his own opinion seems right. You got to study this word and look at it through your spiritual eye. Because you haven't yet arrived at the rest and inheritance which Jehovah your Elohim is giving you. But when you cross the Jordan, the Yarden, and live in the land Jehovah your Elohim is having you inherit, and he gives you rest from all your surrounding enemies so that you are living in safety, then you will bring all that I am ordering you to the palace. Jehovah your Elohim chooses to have his name live. So we know that Solomon fulfilled this, and they were given rest during that time. He says, your burnt offerings, sacrifices, tents, and the offering from your hand and all the best possessions that you dedicate to Jehovah. And you will rejoice in the presence of Jehovah, your Elohim. So when you come together for these festivals, you're presenting yourself before Jehovah. You, your sons and daughters, your male and female slaves, and the Levites staying with you, inasmuch as he has no share or inheritance with you. So when you come to the temple, you're going to bring these animals. We're going to have a festival together and everyone will eat. He said, but be careful not to offer your burnt offering just anywhere you see. In other words, you can only bring these offerings <coughs> to the temple. You can't build your own little temple somewhere. Only to the place that Jehovah designates. And why wouldn't you want to do that? Because it's where he said you should do it. He said, but do it in the place Jehovah will choose in one of your tribal territories. Or prophetically again speaking, David is going to purchase this land in, it will be called Jerusalem. And then in Jerusalem itself, the temple will be built. This is where you are to offer your burnt offerings and do everything I order you to do. However, you may slaughter and eat meat wherever you live. And whenever you want, in keeping with the degree to which Jehovah your Elohim has blessed you, you're not to be wasteful. But if you want me, kill the animal. It's yours. Kill it in the right way and eat it. He says, however, you may slaughter and eat meat wherever you live. And whenever you want, in keeping with the degree to which Jehovah your Elohim blessed you. The unclean and the clean may eat it. 
So when you're killing animals around your home for everyone to eat, the ceremonial aspect of cleansing doesn't have to take place. Everyone is allowed to eat it. Everyone cannot eat the sacrifice brought to the temple. Only believers. As if it were a gazelle or did, just like you went out and shot game. Eat it. Enjoy it. But don't eat the blood. Pour it out on the ground like water. We go to the next page. Verse 17. He says, you are not to eat on your own property the tenth of your grain. Now, don't eat the tenth. That part that's been set aside. The wine or olive oil that you set aside for Jehovah. Or the firstborn of your cattle or sheep. Or any offering you have vowed. Or your voluntary offering. Or the offering from your hand. So those things that belong to Jehovah, you are not to eat or use on your land. No, he says, you are to eat these in the presence of Jehovah, your Elohim, in the place Jehovah, your Elohim, will choose. So, the, of course, we know this is going to be the temple. Once again, Moshe is prophetically speaking. You and your sons, daughters, male and female slaves, and the Levites, who is your guest, and you ought to rejoice before Jehovah, your Elohim, in everything you undertake to do. So we know how to party. But Jehovah is saying on this occasion, you're coming before me. And when you come before me, I want you to have a good time. He says, as long as you are living on your property, take care not to abandon the leaf, the ones who are going to teach you and keep this Torah before you. He said, verse 20, when you over your Elohim expands your territory, as he has promised you, and you say, I want to eat meat, simply because you want to eat meat, then you may eat meat as much as you want. Now, remember, around the tabernacle, at that time, they could not. They had to bring all their animals to the door of the entrance to the courtyard in order for them to be sacrificed and the meat could then be shared and eaten. Once they get in the land, then they might want some meat where you feel free to kill the animal in the manner in which they would have learned how to do because of what the Levites and the priests were doing with all the animals they're bringing to them so they would understand how to correctly slaughter the animal. Then, you can eat meat anywhere you want. He says, if the place which Jehovah your Elohim chooses to place his name is too far away, then you ought to slaughter animals from your cattle or sheep, which Jehovah has given you, and eat on your own property as much as you want. Eat it. So once again, he's repeating. Eat it as you would a gazelle or deer. The unclean and clean alike may eat it. That means a person who is clean or unclean a regular citizen of the ch children of Israel or a slave or anyone else, they can all share in. So the whole concept of sharing and enjoying one another and treating one another properly, Moshe is laying out, this is what Jehovah wants you to do. He said, just take care not to eat the blood, for the blood is the life, and you are not to eat the life with the meat. Pour that blood out on the land. He said, don't eat it, but pour it out on the ground like water. Do not eat it so that things will go well with you and your children after you. As you do what Jehovah sees as right. That's very important. That's why we highlighted it is because you have to do what the Torah says do. Don't make up your own stuff. Do this. He says, only the things set aside for Jehovah, your Elohim, which you have. And the vows you have vowed to make, you must take care and go to the place which Jehovah will choose. Once again, continually repeating this instruction because Moshe is about to leave them. We go on. Verse 27. He says, 
There you will offer your burnt offering, the meat and the blood on the altar of Jehovah your Elohim. So the priest is going to sprinkle that blood on the altar. The blood of your sacrifices is to be poured out on the altar of Jehovah your Elohim, and you will eat the meat. So many of the sacrifices they're making, part of the meat goes to them. The fat, the organs, those are burned on the altar. Only for a complete burnt offering is everything burned up. He says, obey and pay attention. This is Shema. Attention to everything I am ordering you to do so that things will go well with you and with your descendants after you forever as you do what Jehovah sees as good and right. So what he's telling you, do what the word says do because it is good and right in the eyes of Jehovah and everything he does is good. So why not obey? When Jehovah your Elohim has cut off ahead of you the nations you are entering in order to possess, to dispossess, and when you have dispossessed them and are living in the land, be careful after they have been destroyed ahead of you not to be trapped into following them. Once again, that evil inclination is going to come so that you inquire after their God. What did them people do? I wonder what they did that made Jehovah so mad. He said, uh-uh. How did these nations serve their gods? He says, I want you to do the same. He says, no, you must not do this to Jehovah, your elder. Don't treat him the way they treat their God. For he is Lord of Lords. So therefore, you treat him in the manner in which he has instructed you to treat him. For they have done to their gods all the abominations that Jehovah hates. They even burn up their sons and daughters in the fire for their gods. So Jehovah is telling them, and Moshe is telling them, when you get in the land, don't do these things. Just smash them, be done with them. You have to abhor them. You don't want any part of them. And it's the same thing with the dietary laws and everything else. You have to get to the point to where I don't want that. Why? Because Jehovah says it's not good for me, so I'm not going to eat it. I think he knows me better since he created me. So when he says you should abhor it, that means that you don't want it. I'm not going to do it. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to get rid of all the stuff that the scripture tells us you should eat in the land, all over the place. No. You don't do it. And then others in time will learn from what they see you do. Verse third, chapter 13, verse 1, everything I am commanding you, you ought to take care to do. Shema, once again, do not add to it or subtract from it. We have to understand that. And the Ruach HaKodesh is here to help us understand. He says, if a prophet or someone who gets messages while dreaming arises among you and he gives you a sign or wonder, and the sign of wonder comes about as he predicted when he said, let's follow other gods, the prosperity gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. We go on. Moshe says, you are not to listen to what that prophet or dreamer says, for Jehovah your Elohim is testing you. So you see, when that, when that thing manifests, if he's not teaching you what the word says, then Jehovah's testing you to see in order to find out whether you really do love Jehovah your Elohim with all your heart and being. So that's a test for you. Man, I saw him do that and I, I saw it come. He got to be telling us the truth. No, it's got to be based on the word. If it's not based on the word, get rid of it. He says you ought to follow Jehovah your Elohim Fear him, obey his command, misbo. Listen to what he says, serve him and cling to him. This is why you show up for these festivals because you want to get close to Jehovah, your Elohim. At the place he's designated, he would meet you there. And that prophet or dreamer is to be put to death because he urged rebellion against Jehovah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from a life of slavery. In order to seduce you away from the path, Jehovah your Elohim ordered you to follow. This is how 
You are to rid your community of this wickedness. So when people come up with these different things and proclaim that these miracles have come to cosign it, check and see what they are saying. Because it could be Jehovah testing you to see if you're going to follow after that madness. Or are you going to hold forth and hold on and cling to his word? He says, if your brother, the son of your mother, or your son, or your daughter, or your wife, whom you love, or your friend, who means as much to you as yourself, secretly tries to entice you to go and serve other gods, which you haven't known, neither you nor your ancestors, gods of the people surrounding you, whether near or far, away from you, anywhere in the world. You are not to consent. You are not to listen to him. Didn't say kill him. And you must not pity him or spare him, and you must not conceal him. So if it's in the land, of course, you're going to, which is a theocracy, then they're going to be dealt with. Where we are now, we just let that person know, I don't agree with what you're saying. And since I don't agree with what you're saying, you can, what they say, miss me with that. I don't agree with that. He says, rather you must, in the land, you would kill him. Your own hand must be the first one on him and putting him to death. And afterward, the hands of all the people. So you're going to throw the first stone. You ought to stone him to death because he has tried to draw you away from Jehovah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of a life of slavery. Then all Israel will hear about it and be afraid so that they will stop doing such wickedness as this among themselves. Once again, this is when you're in the land, you will do that. Well, obviously, the children of Israel have stopped uh, dealing with that because they got all kind of wickedness. I mean, they even got the Dome of the Rock. So you got all kind of wicked stuff in Israel right now. He goes on. Uh, let me get to the next page. Yeah, there we go. He says, if you hear it told that in one of your cities, which Jehovah your Elohim is giving you to live in, so you know right now, that's talking about in the land, in the land. Certain scoundrels have sprung up among you and have drawn away the inhabitants of their city by saying, let's go and serve other gods, which you haven't known. Then you ought to investigate the matter, inquiring and searching. The See, you're going to check it. You're going to check out what the person's saying. What are they talking about? If the rumor is true, if it is confirmed that such detestable things are being done among you in the land itself, you must put the inhabitants of that city to death with the sword, destroying it completely with the sword, everything in it, including its livestock. Keep all its spoils in an open space and burn the city with its spoils to the ground. For Jehovah your Elohim, it will remain a tale or a, a place of desolation forever and not be built again. And then one of my teachers was talking about it. And guess what now? The capital of the nation is called what? <laughs> Tel Aviv. <laughs> All right. Then Jehovah will turn from his fierce anger and show you mercy. Have compassion on you and increase your numbers as he swore to your ancestors. Provided you listen to what Jehovah says and obey all his commands that I am giving you today. Thus doing what Jehovah your Elohim sees as right. Not what you got in your mind to think is right. If it coincides with the word, then it's what Jehovah sees as right. And he's had it written down for us. Chapter 14. Now we're going to deal with some of the other foolish things that the children of Israel got involved in, but that we still do to this day. He said, you are the people of Jehovah, your Elohim. That's important to understand. We have to understand who we are and whose we are. So we are children of Jehovah, our Elohim. And that's what we need to understand. He says, you are not to gash yourself. This is the same as tattoos and things like that. Why? Because most of that was done in order to worship a false deity. So he says, you don't do that. Or shave the hair above your forehead. In, in, in a manner of mourning for the dead because people did that in the worship of false gods. 
He says, because you are people set apart as holy for Jehovah, your Elohim. Jehovah, your Elohim has chosen you to be his own unique treasure out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. So I got grandkids. It's always, Papa, can we just, is it wrong to have a tattoo? Yeah, because you're putting graffiti on the temple of the Holy Spirit is what I tell them. Oh, Papa, come on. <laughs> Why do you want one? The best you could tell me is because others have it. What does the word say about it? Do you want me to bring you to chapter 14? Do you want me to take you to Leviticus and show you where he says you are not to uh, put these drawings on your body? Even if I do, if you don't believe it, you're going to do what you want to do anyway. Well, we don't know what's going to happen with this tattoo and mess, but I don't know. He says, you are not to eat anything disgusting. So now we're going to talk about animals, our dietary restrictions. The animals which you may eat are the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roebuck, the ibex, the antelope, the oryx, and the mountain sheep. Any animal that has a separate hoof that is completely divided and also chews the cud, these animals you may eat. Once again, going back and explaining to them what they learned in Leviticus. But you are not to eat those that only to chew the cud, the cud or only have a divided hook. For example, the camel, the hare, the cooney, they are unclean for you because they chew the cud but don't have a separate hook. We don't have to wait for science to confirm what we should or should not eat. We can start right here with the understanding of what Jehovah told us. He said, while a pig is unclean for you because although it has a separate hoof, it doesn't chew the cud, which means basically it's like they have two stomachs. He says, you are not to eat meat from those or touch their carcasses. So Moshe is saying, you don't want to be bothered with that. Don't get involved in that. He says, of all that lives in the water, you may eat these, anything in the water that has fins and scales, these you may eat. But whatever lacks fins and scales, you are not to eat. It is unclean for you. He says you may eat any clean bird. Chicken is clean bird. But these you are not to eat. Eagles, vultures, ospreys, kites, any kind of buzzard, any kind of raven, ostriches, screech owls, seagulls, any kind of hawk, little owls, great owls, horned owls, Pelicans, barn owls, uh, cormorants, storks, any kind of heron, that's an animal, not the drug, hoopes, and bats. These are all things that eat other animals. You are not to eat them. They are unclean for us. So we don't eat it. Then he goes on, verse 19, all winged swarming creatures are unclean for you. They are not to be eaten, but all clean flying creatures you may eat. So you go right back to the book of Leviticus, where it talks about the restrictions of what we can and cannot eat. And this is there. Moshe is recounting that and recapturing that for them so they don't forget. He says, you are not to eat any animal that dies naturally. Although you may let a stranger stand with you eat it. Why? Because you will become unclean. You don't willingly become unclean if you don't have to, such as touching a dead person. You might have to touch them, to check them, to see if in fact they're dead. But the stranger doesn't have those restrictions over him. He says, or oh, you could sell it to a foreigner because you are a holy people for your over your elder. He's letting them know you've been set apart. You're going to teach the world how they're supposed to live. So you do what Jehovah has told you you should do. We go on. He goes on and says, you are not to boil a young animal in its mother's milk. Once again, that's the humane aspects of what you're going to do. You don't kill no little calf and then boil it in its mother's milk. You don't do that. That's 
showing humanity. That's why you have a certain way you kill the animals and everything else. You're not to destroy the animal in your desire to have me. You also are to respect Jehovah's creation. He says, every year, you must take one-tenth of everything The, your seed produces in the field and eat it in the presence of Jehovah, your Elohim, in the place where he chooses to have his name, his name live, which is the same place is going to be the temple in Jerusalem. He says, you will eat the tenth of your grain, new wine and oil and olive oil and the firstborn of your cattle and sheep so that you will learn to fear, reverence Jehovah, your Elohim always. But if the distance is too great for you so that you are unable to transport it because the place where Jehovah chooses to put his name is too far away from you. Remember, they're, they're around the tabernacle now. It's right there in front of them, in the middle of them. He says, then when Jehovah, your Elohim, prospers you, you are to convert it into money. Take the money with you. Go to the place which Jehovah, your Elohim, will choose. And their exchange, but what the... Children of Israel were doing what? At the time Yeshua came, they was exchanging all that inside the temple so they could keep the prophets. He says, and exchange the money for anything you want, cattle, sheep, wine, intoxicating liquor, or anything you please. And you are to eat there in the presence of Jehovah, your Elohim, and enjoy yourselves, you and your household. So he's letting them know that if you live that far and you can't get these things all the way to the temple, fine. Sell what you would normally give. Bring the money with you to the temple and purchase what you will share in the presence of Jehovah. He says, but don't neglect the Levite staying with you because he has no share or inheritance like yours. He says, at the end of every three years, you ought to take all the tenths of your produce from that year and store it in your towns. In other words, you're going to give it to the Levites who are living around you. Then the Le Levites, because he had no share or inheritance like yours, along with the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow living in your towns, will come eat and be satisfied. So that Jehovah, your Elohim, will bless you in everything your hands produce. So his desire of Jehovah is to bless you. And he has already established, if you do these things, blessings will come. Uh, it will rain when it's supposed to rain. You will harvest good crop. Your male and your feet, you, the male and the females of the household will not become sterile. All of these are part of being obedient. So he wants you to do what he has asked you to do so that the blessings will flow. He says at the end of every seven years, this is chapter 15 now, you ought to have a Shemitah. The Shemitah is a what? The seventh year. He says, here is how. Oh, let me get into that next page. Here is how the Shemitah is to be done. Every creditor is to give up what he has loaned to his fellow member of the community. He is not to force his neighbor or relative to repay it because Jehovah's time of remission has been proclaimed. They're going to bring out the, uh, the trumpets. They're going to blow the fact that this is the Shemitah year. And if they do what they're supposed to do, then everyone gets another and fresh start in life. And he's going to go through that so that we don't get crazy with it and try to figure out ways we can get around it. He says, you may demand that a foreigner repay his debt, but you ought to release your claim on whatever your brother owes you. In spite of this, there will be no one needy among you because Jehovah will certainly bless you in the land which Jehovah your Elohim is giving you as an inheritance to possess. If only you will listen, Moses says, Shma, carefully to what Jehovah your Elohim says and take care to obey all these commands I am giving you today. Yes, Jehovah your Elohim will bless you as he promised. Those blessings are already established. You will lend money to many nations without having to borrow, and you will rule over many nations without their ruling over you. This is, of course, in the land of Israel, but it will, it can relate to the promises Jehovah has given us here. 
Don't close your hand up now when he bless you with finances. Don't close your hand up. Lend. Lend or give. Either way, he says, because what? He's going to bless you. He goes on verse 7. If someone among you is needy, one of your brothers in any of your towns in your land, which Jehovah your Elohim is giving you, you are not to harden your heart or shut your hand from giving to your needy brother. No, you must open your hand to him and lend him enough to meet his need and enable him to obtain what he wants, which is to be able to provide for his family. He says, guard yourself against allowing your heart to entertain the mean-spirited thought that because the seventh year, the year of Shemitah is at hand, you would be stingy toward your needy brother and not loan or give him anything. For then he may cry out to Jehovah against you and it will be your sin. Whenever you know to do right and don't do it, it's sin. He's already said, I'm going to bless you for honoring this. But now you don't trust that, nah, no, you should, you should have done something better. No, nah, I'm not going to do it. He said, rather, you must give to him. And you are not to be grudging when you give to him. That's why Shaul talks about you. God loves a cheerful giver. He says, if you do this, Jehovah your Elohim will bless you in all your work and everything you undertake. For there will always be poor people in the land. That is why I am giving you this order. You must open your hand to your poor and needy brother in your land. Why? As you do that, he said, I'm going to bless you even more. We go on. If your kinsman, a Hebrew, a Hebrew man or a woman, is sold to you, he is to serve you for six years. But in the seventh year, you ought to set him free. You're going to set him free. Moreover, when you set him free, don't let him leave empty-handed, but supply him generously from your flock, threshing floor, and wine press. From what Jehovah your Elohim has blessed you with, you ought to give to him. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and Jehovah your Elohim redeemed you. That is why I am giving you this order today. But if he says to you, I don't want to leave because he loves you and your household and because his life with you is good. In other words, he's getting blessed anyway. He says, why would I want to leave? I'll continue to stay and serve you. I got me a nice house and I'll just serve you because why? In serving you, I'm blessed. I eat, got a house. I'm good, he says. Because he loves you and your household and because his life with you is a good one, then take an out. You're going to pierce his ear, give him an earring, and he will be your slave forever. Do the same with your female servant. Now you take him to the people at the gate, to the judges, and you present this to them. He says, don't resent it, don't resent it when you set him free. Since during his six years of service, he has been worth twice as much as a hired employee. He worked for you diligently. Bless him as he leaves. Don't be mad because he's gone. In this country, they be, our ancestors perpetual slaves forever. <laughs> That's not, that was not anywhere near what Jehovah had instructed people they should do. Remember that the children of Israel are supposed to teach the world how they're supposed to behave towards one another. He says, verse 19, all firstborn males in your herd of cattle and in your flock, you ought to set aside for Jehovah your Elohim, right? He goes on, you are not to do any work with the firstborn from your herd or shear a firstborn sheep. Each year, you and your household are to eat it in the presence of Jehovah your Elohim in the place which Jehovah will choose. Once again, you're going to take that animal to the temple it's going to be sacrificed and you're going to get part of the meat to eat. But if it has a defect, is lame or blind or has some other kind of fault, you are not to sacrifice it to Jehovah, your Elohim. And the priests were going to be held accountable for this. Well, the priests were taking bribes and doing all other kind of crazy things. And so eventually they were put out of the land. He says, rather, 
eat it on your own property. Now that lamb, that's lame. You can do that. The unclean and the clean alike may eat it. Like the gazelle or the deer. You went hunting and caught that. Because you're not going to sacrifice a gazelle or a deer. Those are not animals that are okay for sacrifice. He says, just don't eat its blood, but pour it out on the ground like water. Now we're getting into chapter 16. Now we're going to get into the festivals. The These are Jehovah's appointed times. Observe the, the month of Aviv, which is the first month, and keep Pesach, or Passover, to Jehovah your Elohim. For in the month of Aviv, the first month, Jehovah your Elohim brought you out of Egypt at night. You are to sacrifice the Pesach offering or the Passover offering from the flock and herd to Jehovah your Elohim in the place where Jehovah will choose to have his name live. Because you're going to be there at Pesach. You're going to be at the temple. You're going to bring that animal, sacrifice it there, and he says you are not to eat any hammocks or any leaven with it. For seven days, right after that, you're in the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. You are to eat with it matzah, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste. No leaven. Thus you will remember the day you left the land of Egypt as long as you live. No leaven is to be seen with you anywhere in your territory for seven days. None of the meat from your sacrifice on the first day in the evening is to remain all night until morning. That Passover lamb, that you're going to roast and eat and then burn up anything you don't finish. You may not sacrifice the Pesach offering in just any of the towns that Jehovah your Elohim is giving you, but at the place where Jehovah your Elohim will choose to have his name live. There is where you are to sacrifice the Pesach offering. In the evening, when the sun sets at the time of year that you came out of Egypt. So that is the month of Avi. Then he goes on. He says, what you're supposed to do with it? You are to roast it and eat it in the place Jehovah your Elohim will choose. In the morning, you will return to go to your tents. For six days, you are to eat matzah. You are to eat matzah for six days. Right there. And on the seventh day, there is to be a festival assembly for Jehovah your Elohim. Do not do any kind of work. So it's almost like a Shabbat or a Sabbath. He says you are to count seven weeks. Now we're getting ready for Shavuot. You are to begin counting seven weeks from the time you first put the, your sickle to the standing grain. This is a barley crop. And there's a time, and that's explained also in the book of Leviticus, like chapter 21 to 25. He says, you ought to observe the festival of Shavuot, which we call weeks because of the seven weeks. For Jehovah your Elohim with a voluntary offering, which you are to give in accordance with the degree in which Jehovah your Elohim has prospered you. So now your tent is going to be a little bit larger because he's prospering you. He says, you ought to rejoice in the presence of Jehovah your Elohim. You, your sons and daughters, your male and female slaves, the Levites living in your towns and the foreigners, orphans and widows living among you. Everybody's going to feast at this time in the place where Jehovah your Elohim will choose to have his name live. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt. Then you will keep and obey these laws. You are to keep the festival of Sukkot. Now he's getting into Sukkot. For seven days after you have gathered the produce of your threshing floor and your wine press, rejoice, he says, at your festival. So Sukkot, which takes place in the fall, you, your sons and daughters, your male and female slaves, the Levites, he said, seven days. So you're going to have a festival for seven days. Sukkot is only, I mean, Shavuot is only two. But here again, you're doing seven. So you're going to have a festival for seven days. And you're going to, you ought to keep the festival for Jehovah, your Elohim, in the place Jehovah, your Elohim will choose. You're going to Jerusalem because Jehovah, your Elohim, will bless you in all your crops and in all your work. So you ought to be full of joy. So you happy anyway. So now the temple's not standing. We can't go to the temple. But that doesn't mean we can't have fellowship 
get into the word and enjoy ourselves and teach our children that they are children of Jehovah our Elohim. You're children of your God, and he wants you to come and celebrate and have festival at this time. And everybody's invited. Everybody's going to bring something, and you rejoice. He says three times a year, all your men are to appear in the presence of Jehovah your Elohim in the place which he will choose, at the temple in Jerusalem, at the festival of Matzah, which is what? Right after Pesach, at the festival of Shavuot, and at the festival of Sukkot. They are not to show up before Jehovah empty hand. So don't come thinking you're going to just eat at our festivals. No, you're going to bring something. Why? Because God has given you something. And you want to share with others the blessings of Jehovah our Elohim. He said, but every man is to give what he can in accordance with the blessing Jehovah your Elohim has given you. So, this concludes our lesson. Our lesson for today has concluded. I, I hope you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you during this lesson as you begin to understand because the more we understand, the more we can do. And so we want to just keep that in mind always. The reason we study this, and this is year three, and we're getting ready into this month to begin and get ready for year four. The reason we do that is because we love learning about what Jehovah wants us to do finding out what the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, will speak to us as we study and doing all that we have been empowered by the Ruach HaKodesh to do. So some of these things is new. We don't really understand everything we're going to do. But look, we're going to set our hearts to do what Jehovah has commanded us to do. We're going to celebrate these festivals. We're going to rid ourselves of these foolish practices that so many people that call themselves Christians want to be a part of. We're going to eliminate that from what we do. And we're going to be blessed by obedience. So with that, that completes our lesson. Now here's our closing prayer. From Numbers verse, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. May Jehovah bless you. Wait a minute. Bless you and keep you. May Jehovah make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may Jehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This is our priestly blessing for you at this time. So with that, we're going to get out of our shared screen. I don't know why that does that and I can't figure it out. So Thank you all so much for joining us on this lesson tonight. I hope you have been blessed as we have in preparation. And so with that, shalom.